Carly McCoskison and family. That's the title. You could hear the sound of scraping. You could see the dirt and ice flying. You could feel the earth shake like a giant steam engine rumbling down what is now the Muskegon River bottom. Above all that din, two gigantic voices hollered, Christina, you and the kids have got to hold those tusks of Muskegon's down flat to the ground all the time or we're going to have no river bottom. Can you do that, my good woman? Yeah, sure we can, Carly, you betcha. But we don't want to hurt poor old Muskegus's face poking it down like this. We ain't gonna hurt that old walrus. It sharpens and cleans those huge tusks. Remember how we made our swimming pools in them icebergs with his help? He loved it. Muskegus's was such a big walrus that once several mountain climbers started up his side, they had the whizbits scared out of them when he started to move. Christina, my queen. Yeah, Carly McHoskison, my love. We're going to fly this here sledge and make the big gouge for about seven miles. Then I'm going to pull Muskegus's tusks up a bit to make some nice big rapids here in this stream. Careful, Carly, I know you'll, it'll break your soft heart if you run over any of them tell-me-nothing tribes people. I'll watch the ones here on the sledge. You tell the rest of them squirts to get up in those pine trees. I got Schuberg and the pew hooked up and ready to run. <laughs> those were the names of the two monsters caribou. The first name was really Iceberg. But where Carly and Christina came from, it was so cold, they couldn't open their mouth to say ice. But they could get their lips puckered up to say shoo. And the pew, his original name was Gary, but one time after he'd been eating arctic grass and was upwind, one of the little ones said, Mommy, what's all the pew? Now he's the pew. There was a time when Macosta County was not hilly and loaded with sparkling lakes. It had no beautiful Muskegon River. Once it was flat as pancake. Part covered with pines, the rest muddy, brown swamp. Lots of it was pretty boring, ugly territory. This was long before the Potawatomi and Chief Macosta. The area was peopled by a primitive, antisocial, rigid, dense, boring tribe of midgets, about three feet tall, called the tell me nuns. <clears throat> they were so primitive that they ate only natural foods, tree bark, weed roots, and clouds. Clouds often hung over this dreary land and covered the pine trees with moisture. The people would either lick the moisture from the branches or on more adventurous days they would hold each other out of the branches to suck in the moisture like midget vacuum cleaners. They must have originally come from tropic climes because they always ran about semi-naked even when the weather got cooler. When they turned purplish they thought the gods were telling them it was time to hide from the weather. They made the awfulest looking holes in the swamps put some grody logs around to keep the mud from falling in on them, covered the opening with weeds and remained there until it got warmer. Neighboring tribes would pass by with suggestions like how to snare rats and squirrels for better food. They tried to show them how to weave thicker clothing. The tell me nothings were so primitive that they really had no formal language. They communicated by grunting oohs and ahs, patting their behinds at different strengths and rhythms, and making wheezing noise by placing their hands under their armpits and moving their arms up and down. Their response to the helpful neighboring tribes people was wheeze, slappy, slap, slap, poo poo, ah, grunt, grunt, grunt. Translation, we are tell me nothings. It was good enough for our grandparents, it's good enough for us. 
We'd rather starve and be cold purple than switch. Then the really cold weather began. Now it's time to go far north of the Tell Me Nothings to the polar regions where Carly McCoskinson and family lived before they came south. Carly! Christina! I know that we just love riding mosquitoes down these hills into the ice floes, but it's getting colder and colder. I think an ice age is coming. Yeah, sure, just look out there, Carly. Carly and his people were very large and very tall. When Carly said, look out there, he meant, look a long, long way out there. And the children, continued Christina, it's too cold now for the ten of them to go and play. Carly two and Christina four nearly lost fingers to frostbite last night. It's not that we don't care about our little dears by giving them such a light names. Carly often said, it's just faster in the blizzard than they're out there swimming around them icebergs to call out a number like C2, K4, like that. One evening as they were reading the Daily Seal, in their tent, Christina complained, Carly, I know you care for these here animals, but if you can't get out of the house with Muskegon's big nose in the door and the pew outside behind with his behind against the door, the breath of that walrus makes the place smell like a dead pike. And the pew, we could have a gas explosion in here. I think it's time we move south. It was so cold that night that the breath from the animals <clears throat> froze into a mountain icicle 125 feet high. The next morning, Carly took a frozen leg from a departed caribou and used it as an axe to dig giant steps in the icicle. When he got topside, he hung out like a sailor on a mast. With his hand to his forehead, he hollered, By golly, as I'm looking south. And remember, for Carly, a look was a far one. I see trees and even a little land. Well, south they went on a sledge with the ten kids sitting on Muskegus's. They pulled him head first, his tusks functioning as runners. Schuberg and Depew pulled them at ferocious speeds down the iceways. Natives reported that the entourage was so large they thought they saw galloping mountains. As they rode, Carly and Christina sang old runic folk songs from way back like, Oh, from the ice and snow we come, now to the fairest land we run. The kids listened to them sing, then they sang along. They got a kick out of changing words like fairest to carest to parest. Carly laughed and said, okay, when we stop, we'll call that place fairest place. Parest. When they tried to say it, their tongues were so cold they couldn't pronounce the T, so it became Paris. It's said that some old runics got hold of that and named another city somewhere in Europe with the same name. Copycats. <laughs> Three quarters of the way down, they saw ice script in the sky. It said, ooh, ah, burp, slap, slap. Frozen, tell me nothing, gibberish. Their primitive noises were coming through the ground and rising like ice balloons. Carly and family continued to travel until they saw where the balloons rose. Here you are, this is Paris, chuckled Christina. Er, 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 grunted Muskegasus. He crawled out of the rope loop around his head. The frozen balloons stopped. The party of huge people and animals watched as the tell me nothings started to come out of the ground. The little folks thought that the walrus grunts were the sounds of distant relatives. Because of the cold, they looked dark purple. They got a load of the mountain of humanity walrus and caribou before them, panicked, and they began to chatter. Carly and family looked on in amazement as these small, little purplish people 
It was a bee's nest of animated grunting, moaning, slapping of butts, and high-pitched armpit wheezing. Carly thought they were dancing. He began singing another piece. The tell me nuns had never heard a musical note before. They stood boogle-eyed, but eventually began to grunt and slap in some kind of rhythm. Christina was so overjoyed to see them catching on that she danced and she kicked up her boots. She slammed down so hard that the poor little folks thought it was an earthquake. Her left boot left a big hole in the ground. Look, said Carly. Her boot chipped away at the hard clay crust and bent down some. Someday, when we get water here, this will call Chip Away Lake. The kids were so cold they could not smile and say, Chip Away. They could only frown and say, Wah, Chippewa Lake to this day. Frightened by the thunder of her boot, the tummy nuttons started to head for their underswamp lean-tos. Oh, Daddy and Mommy, these little people are so cute, cried out the kids. We left our dolls up north. Can we dress them up? Well, before the midgets could get underground, the kids put some of them on their knees and cleaned the swamp grody off them. Christina took hair, the caribou shed, and put together little warm pants and skirts and suits. The kids ran to the trees and made pine needle snow hats. Carly had a small piece of tusk that Muskegus had broken off years before. He fashioned little shoes for them out of that sliver. The kids began diving into the caribou fur like it was a pile of autumn leaves. One, then another, and another of the tell me nothings did the same thing. A new sound emitted from their mouths. Laughter. Carly pulled out some glob he had made way back, and he started to sing, Oh, then the glog hits my stomach with a bang, and then I start dancing with the gang, and whiz, whiz, bang, I flip my ear, legs in the air, cause it's time for the McCostason family polka. Everybody danced. The tell me nothings learned another new thing. They were happy. That's the first time happy, and for that matter, learn, ever occurred to them. Suddenly, it came to Carly. You got no river. By gum, we got to have one of them. These people had no idea what a river was. They were about to grunt and slap out their usual response to anything new, but they didn't. The tell me nothings began to like being told and shown new things. So now we're where this story began. Carly's ready to rip up turf to make a riverbed. He's pulling Muskegus by the tail so the tusks act as a plow. Carly called to Christina. Hey, my love, now that we got them tell me nothings dressed warm and smiling, put a bunch of them on the sledge next to you and I'll give them the ride of their life. Carly, when we're done with this here riverbed, while you're working on the rapids, I'm going to step back here and make a big fire to melt ice. Those caribou are thirsty. Later, Christina pulled up two pine trees while the kids got tons of branches for the big fire. She rubbed them together and poof, fire. The fire melted snow all the way up to what is now Houghton Lake. The water started to run. Carly and Muskegus finished making the rapids. He headed upstream and saw Christina and the kids. They each had scared tell me nothings hanging all over them. Carly let the whole tribe scramble onto him. He put his arm to the ground like a giant game plank so they could climb down. They all stood on the bank and marveled at the new river. Muskegus swam and frolicked in underwater. The tell me nothings thought the walrus had drowned. <coughs> they made sad grunts. <coughs> Christina did not understand. <coughs> Slowly, they tried to form their first words. Must he gone? they asked. Christina understood. He's not gone, he's swimming. Dad 
that's your first word, exclaimed Carly. We'll give the river the name so you always remember who made it for you. Must be gone, they all shouted, and it stuck. <laughs> Depew and Schubert lapped gallons of river water. The tribe looked and tried to say something else. They pointed to their dry tongues hanging out, drew a finger line from there down their throat to their stomach. You're thirsty, asked Christina. Put water in me, your sand, asked Carly. They grunted, slapped their butts, stopped, and then tried to say what Carly had just said. Pota, pointing to their mouths. Wada, pointing to the river. Me, Pota, Wada, me. We understand, laughed Carly. He gave them little cups made from plant seed pods the caribou were eating, and they drank real water. They loved the river so much that eventually they changed their name in honor of that first day of thirst quenching and called themselves Potawatomi. The Potawatomi named some of their children after the names of the caribou, and those families are around Carly's Big Rapids to this day. Muskegasus enjoyed flopping in the river of his namesake. The kids and tribal people loved riding him like a giant battleship. At one point, he lost a part of his tusk in the river. It got stuck on the bottom, right where the old dam is built, or was later built. The builders did not need a concrete foundation. They put that dam on the ancient remains of a giant walrus tusk. Go down there and look for yourself. The weather started to warm. Carly and family got itchy for colder climes. Before we go, Carly announced to the tribe, Muskegasus has a gift for you. You gotta start getting fish out of this here river, said Carly. Carly rode Muskegasus to the great lake they had to cross to get back home. Muskegasus was so big, you could look from Paris and see him up where the Mackinac Bridge is now. He stuck his big head into the lake, loaded up with tons of fish, brought them back and spit them into the river. He dumped them just about where that trout hatchery is there in Paris. <coughs> The gang was on the sledge to head north. A young Potawatomi princess carrying a baby came to Carly. She, like many of the tribe now with a decent diet, was over five feet tall. She asked, Carly, would you please bless this little one? I've named him Macosta in honor of you. When he grows up and has children, one of them will be Macosta's son. You and your family have done so much for us. The Legend of Danny Fisher. Danny Fisher, the name that every fisherman in the entire county of Macosta knows and respects. But did you guys ever hear the story of what made old Danny so famous? Well, even if you do know it, here it is. Danny was a bear of a man, seven feet tall with a handlebar mustache so big it sometimes got stuck in doorways. When that happened, he had to back up and enter the door sideways. His hair stuck out on all sides so that it always looked like he had a bright red porcupine sitting on his head. He was a fisher by name and a fisher by trade. He always carved his own lures because he said that he didn't trust anyone else to do it for him. He made them so realistic it fooled more than just the fish. When his elderly aunt came to his parents' house, she spent hours roasting what looked to be a delicious salmon only to find after she had bitten into it, it was actually made of wood. The hook got stuck in her dentures, and since then, everybody dreads a kiss from Aunt Gertrude. <laughs> Indeed, Danny could have been the most successful fisherman on the Muskegon River, except that he had one flaw. Every time that he caught a fish, he would throw it back, saying, too small, not worth it. Danny became something of a legend even then, because whatever the size of a fish, from the smallest minnow to a monster trout five feet long, he would throw it back, saying, too small, not worth it. That was when the big drought came to Big Rapids. For the first day or so, folks didn't worry. After all, there had been hotter days than that. Not very many, but there had been a few. However, people started to really worry when the sun didn't go and disappear onto the horizon like it had ever since anyone could remember. It was only the first day when the grass started to wither, 
and it would only be a matter of time before the mighty Muskegon dried up to just a trickle. Well, that sure got Danny's attention. After all, a person can't fish if there isn't any river. So Danny got to thinking, what was different about the sky? Danny got up from his rocking chair and looked to the heavens. He didn't have to look long or far. The moon was stuck on the brand new flagpole in the center of town, flapping like the good old stars and stripes on a windy day. Of course, that was the problem. Seeing as the sun chases the moon across the sky, if the moon stopped, then so would the sun. Danny knew that there was no time to lose. Already, great big clouds of steam were wafting up in the mighty Muskegon. Screwing up all of his courage, Danny took a gargantuan leap up and slid back down again. He landed splat in the mud at the base of the pole. Being new, he was more slippery than a greased eel. Finally, with a great deal of willpower, spit, and hard work, along with 50 more splats at the base of the pole, Danny reached the top at last. He gently pulled the moon off the pole with a technique perfected from years of taking fish off his hook. The moon soared gracefully over the treetops. Everything should have been just fine and dandy, but it wasn't. The sun, which still had high up in the sky, seemed to take no notice of the moon getting away. It just stayed up there, blazing as brightly as ever on the hot town of Big Rapids. Then, by some miracle, a small round cloud came into the sky. The sun ignored that cloud until the cloud got so close it could have tickled the sun's nose. The sun then pursued the cloud in little circles until the cloud evaporated with a little farewell. <coughs> that gave Danny an idea. If the sun could be fooled by a little round cloud, then one of his lures would certainly be able to pull the wool over its eyes. He lost no time in beginning to carry out his plan. He didn't even take time to change his mud-caked clothing. And he just sprinted to his workshop faster than the wind, that is, if there had been any wind. He got out his two-man cross-cut saw. Now, Danny was so tremendously strong and massive that he didn't even need another person to saw with him. He just put his right hand on one of the handles and his left hand on the other and started to work. Unfortunately, there weren't very many trees around. He happened to be sawing down the last patch of cool, refreshing shade from his yard. He thought to himself, it's worth the sacrifice, if only I could get that whale of a sun out of the sky. He set to work sawing feverishly. From a distance, it looked like he was doing a dance with the tree. The movement was so catchy that his neighbors started to do it too. The dance became known throughout America as the white-cheeked Wabai Watusi later known as just the Watusi. After a brief time working, Danny had a flat slab of wood from the middle of the tree about the ten inches thick. That tree must have been at least ten feet wide, because even Danny could barely get his arms around it. He took the slab to his workshop and started to carve the features of the man in the moon into the wood. The chisel flashed across the wood like lightning between his sausage-like fingers. Once he had carved the wood, he stepped back to survey his work. To his great surprise, the carved face of the moon looked like a cross between Abraham Lincoln and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> when he had finished sanding his piece, he set about to make the most gigantic fishing pole the world has ever seen. He searched the entire county of Acosta, from Millbrook to Paris, and from Barrington to Morley, for something that was suitably tall enough for the job. It felt like he had put in a long day's work, but it could have been high noon for all he knew, because the sun never went down. <coughs> Danny was exhausted and didn't have very much luck finding his pole. In the moment of weariness, he leaned up against the brand new flat pole in the center of Big Rapids to mop his brow. Suddenly, he shot into the air as if an angry hornet had stung him on the seat of his britches. By the whiskers on a catfish, I can't believe it. All this time, and the perfect pole was staring me smack dab in the nose, and a humdinger of a line to boot. Without even waiting for permission, Danny impulsively ripped the pole out of the ground. He figured that the town council would probably forgive him if he could end the drop that had held him across the county in its sweltering grip. Danny ran back home with pole and line in tow, and tied his gigantic moon-shaped lure to the rope. 
Without stopping to catch his breath, he rushed to the blacksmith's shop. In his great excitement, Danny took one of the long iron poles leaning it against the wall and bent it into an enormous fish hook. This he also tied to the line and took the whole contraption to the outskirts of town. He whirled the line and tackle around his head to get a feel for the weight, then sent it spinning through the air. The projectile plummeted back to earth, whistling like a key, like a tea kettle as it came down. When it landed, it made a deep impression in the soil, which later became known as Winter's Creek. But that's another story. Even though this attempt didn't work, it sure got the sun's attention. Danny could tell by the way that the sun bellowed and zigzagged through the sky. He smiled and said, Now there's a fish worth catching. Summoning up all of his remaining strength, Danny flung his rod into the air one more time. This time, the hook and lure stayed right up there in the sky. He immediately saw why. The hook had snagged on one of the last wispy clouds still remaining in the atmosphere. Straight away, the sun instantly gulped up the hook. Danny thought that he had caught the sun, hook, line, and sinker, until his legs lifted off the ground. He flew through the air like a flying fish. That is, if a flying fish screamed in more suspenders. He soared over City Hall, and on that day, people all over Macosta County saw a very strange sight. A man, wearing muddy clothes, holding on to a gigantic fishing pole, screaming like, well, a man flying through the air on a gigantic fishing pole. The next thing Danny knew, he was losing height quickly just as he was flying over his own home. Suddenly, his clothesline hit him smack dab in the face, and it became tangled around his mustache. The sun lifted back into the air, and Danny was trailing his wet laundry across, across the sky. At last, the sun was back in orbit around the sky, circling the globe just like it always had. Then, by some stroke of luck, the sun burns through the last remaining strands of rope that were tying into Danny. In free fall, he grabbed the closest thing at hand to slow his speed. He drifted gently to the ground, using his giant waders as a parachute. From that day onward, it wasn't an uncommon sight to see Danny at the top of a tree with the flagpole in his hands, waiting to catch the sun again. He caught many things, including the moon, clouds, and several stars, but he always released them back, saying, too small, not worth it. And that is the legend of Danny Fisher. Um, my story is called A Tale of the Legendary Horsecock. It's a beautiful June Big Rabbit's morning. The sun is rising, the sky is clear, and the town is calm. Beep, 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 beep. The alarm sounds at 8.30 a.m. after four 15-minute snoozes. I'm scheduled to be at work at 8. I instantly jar myself awake, realizing that I'm significantly late. I rush to find a pair of pants. I struggle to get my entire body into the left pant leg, only to end up tripping and falling sideways into my closet, knocking all the clothes off their hangers. I find a wrinkly shirt tied from underneath me and quickly tie a double Windsor knot. I make my way to the kitchen, grab a granola bar, rip it open, and hold it between my teeth as I slip on my shoes and hurry out the door. I get to my small silver Volkswagen and pat my pockets, realizing I forgot my keys in the house. With the granola bar still in my mouth, I rush to the front door, only to find I locked myself out. Luckily, the window on the porch was unlocked, and I could climb my way through the window under the horizontal blinds. The blinds annoyingly rattle in my face back and forth until I can't stand it and I rip them down. I'll fix that later, I think. Finally, I retrieve my keys and return to my car. I jam my car into reverse and recklessly back out of my driveway, as only a tardy person can. My tires squeal loudly as I pull onto Woodward, disturbing the peaceful calm of the morning. I head east on Woodward until I get to State Street intersection, where the light turns red as I approach, forcing me to stop. Chomping on my granola bite, I impatiently wait for the light to change, looking back and forth as I wait. When it does, I turn left and then immediately right onto Linden Street, reaching Michigan Avenue. I blow through the stop sign, turn left, and immediately begin heading north. I'm the only car downtown. I press the accelerator, anxiously trying to get to my destination. As I approach the lights on Michigan and Maple, it turns yellow. I press the gas harder and my four-cylinder engine responds sheep my four-cylinder engine responds sheepishly as my revolutions per minute jump from twelve hundred to twelve hundred ten.
The increased revolutions only mentally increased my speed enough to pass under the pink light. By this time, I'm going at least 92.6 miles an hour. Relieved at making the close call, I glanced at my rearview mirror to make sure I was not seen pushing the confines of the local street laws. In the midst of my glance, I noticed a unique shape in my mirror. The black shape appears to be chasing me down. Is that a horse? I think I'll allow with a mouthful of granola bar, so it sounded more like, a little horse? It was. The horse cop Jesse and his partner Officer Little were in hot pursuit. Officer Little was hunched over, knees bent, holding himself slightly off the saddle with his arms and hands in front of him. He looked like a Kentucky Derby jockey. Jesse was stretching his legs and running as fast as he could to catch me. His muscles jiggled and tightened as he ran. In disbelief, I see and hear them gaining on me, and quickly. The unmistakable clip-clop sound of Jesse's horseshoes crescendos as they approach. By the time I'm in front of the old Pioneer store, Jesse and his law enforcement jockey had passed me. They speed past until they are in front of Bernie's Donuts. Officer Little yanks on the reins, and Jesse comes to a screeching halt. Sparks fly from his horseshoes sliding across the pavement from the abrupt stop. Smoke rises as the asphalt smolders in the wake of his sparks. The two officers turn and face me in the middle of the road. Now, maybe I'm disillusioned, but I swear to you, Officer Little was wearing a brown leather jacket and matching leather gloves, a red handkerchief around his neck, a six-shooter in his belt, spurs on his cowboy boots, and a big cowboy hat. His badge was a five-point star that read Sheriff in the middle. I swear, it was so shiny and bright, I could see it. Sorry. I swear, it was so shiny and bright, I knew what it was from a block away. Regardless, I had just been run down by a horse guy going 112 miles an hour, and we were facing each other like a Wild West do. I look in my rearview mirror hoping to see a band of Indians chasing them like the cowboy Indian tradition. But it only... But there was nothing of the sort. It was just me, my pursuers, and the lonely bear road. I look back at Jesse and Officer Little. There's an eerie stillness about downtown. Halfway between us a dry, barren tumbleweed slowly rolls across the road. The owner of Pepper steps out for a moment to put out an open sign. But as soon as she does, the creaky door, as soon as she opens the creaky door, she rushes back to the safety, realizing the tension in the air. A man with a cowboy hat and his head down dramatically leans on one of the stone columns in front of the Nisbet building, playing the harmonica. Appropriately, appropriately he plays old West music from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. The tune is easily recognized. Oh, oh, oh. Wah, wah, wah. The music stops. An eight-foot Michigan rattlesnake slithers into the middle of the, middle of the road where the tumbleweed had crossed. As the snake shimmies, a red-tailed hawk swoops up, talons down, or swoops down, talons up, and snatches the reptile. The, the hawk screeches and flies off to remove himself and his dinner from the situation. The snake futilely wriggles as he takes his unwanted flight. Silence follows, and builds the intensity as Jesse and Officer Little and I stare at each other. A whip cracks, immediately obliterating the silence. Jesse and Officer Little begin running at me full speed. The man playing the harmonica begins again, this time with a much, with a much faster, intense background music. I step on the gas to show I'm not afraid, then immediately stop, realizing how wrong it was for me to play chicken with a law enforcement horse and his partner. They get five feet from me, and Little pulls the reins again. <coughs> Jesse rears back on his hind quarters and moves his legs up and down. His metal horseshoes, horseshoes glow a bright orange like the blacksmith that just pulled them out of the embers. He lets out a loud, intimidating whinny. Officer Little Will shifts his weight to stay balanced and raises his hand, swinging his cowboy hat over his head. On the descent from his hind quarters, Jesse slams his hooves onto the hood of my car. His legs straight and his eyes blazing, he stares at me indictingly. He lets out a heavy breath and the air from his flared nostrils fogs my windshield. Busted. <laughs> Jesse climbs off my hood under Little's, Little's direction and firmly plants all four hooves on the asphalt. His black coat and mane glisten in the rising sun. Also, Little looks and points directly at me like an old Uncle Sam poster. Then he points to the side of the road with all, all with a serious look on his face. When he points to the side of the road, Jesse nods and shakes his head to, to reiterate his partner's sentiments. With no choice and no way around the exceptionally fast horse and the exceptional horseman, I oblige the officers. 
Confused at what was happening, I shake my head in disbelief. At this point, I realize I had packed what was left of my granola bar into my cheek, like a chipmunk, during the excitement. I swallow and pull over. Where the prompt smirked, Jesse clip flops on the pavement, moving him and his partner to the side of my car. I press my power window button and it opens slowly. The unmistakable smell of horse, more specifically horse stable, whilst into my car and bust my nostrils. All I can see are cowboy boots, spurs, and the dark shiny coat of Jesse's belly. <coughs> I'm, I'm so close I can watch the expansion and contraction of Jesse's breath. My car is dwarfed by the law enforcement agents. License and registration police, a faceless voice from far above the booth and roof of my small Volkswagen. I search through the golf cart and find the necessary documentation. I reach it out the window and stick my arm straight up to hand it off. Realizing the officer is much too high, I unbuckle and hang out my car window so we can reach. After much straining and reaching from both of us, we have a successful handoff. Do you know why I pulled you over, Officer Little Ass? Uh, I do not, sir. I respond knowing full well it could have been the screeching tigers pulling out of my house, the rolling stop sign at the intersection of Michigan and Linden, the pink stoplight, my excessive speed, or my brief negligent game of chicken. Your passenger side taillight is out, he responds. <laughs> what? I respond in disbelief, thinking it was any number of my other offenses in the half mile I had just traveled. Yeah, you were slowing down for the light on Michigan and Maple, and your taillight did not work. You'd better get that fixed. Thank you, officer, I reply in disbelief. Oh, also, I heard you screech your tires up when you left your house on Woodward, so I blow through that stop sign, run a red light, and you were speeding, Officer Little says, dropping the actual charges down on me. That light was pink, I argue. Pink, he asked. Stoplights are considered pink the split second when they're yellow and a box turned red. Running a pink light is not illegal, I believe. Yes, but running light at any color, going 127.3 in a 25 zone, is very illegal, he replies. They move in front of my car, and Officer Little begins writing on a citation pad. Jesse looks back at me, flicking his ears, reprimanding me like a school principal who just wants to make sure their students know what they did wrong. After a few minutes, they come back to my car. Again, straining to make the handoff, we finally accomplish the exchange. I'm issuing you a couple tickets, Mr. Fisher. Officer Little says facetiously, handing me his entire citation pad, each one filled out with a different transgression. <laughs> the equine re rears up on his back legs one more time and lets out a triumphant window. He sets back down on all fours and turns southward. Before he takes off, he looks at me and winks forgivingly. Jesse begins running faster than he ever had, and he and his partner quickly disappear over the horizon into the colors of the rising sun near Ferris State. Still today, if you look hard enough, you can find indentations of Jesse's horseshoes in the pavement from the departure into the rising sun. They serve as a constant reminder of Jesse, his passion, and his pride for serving Big Rapids. Now, as much as those fines cost me, and let me tell you, they cost me a lot, in a way, I appreciate my running with Jesse. I appreciate it because I got to experience the truth of his legend that will never be forgotten. Thank you.